Tonight, the projected landslide election victory in Russia. Vladimir Putin on track to win another six years. Protests amid what's being called record turnout. Dissidents throwing Molotov cocktails, pouring dye in ballot boxes. Putin saying his win means the country is united behind him, but critics allege the vote was rigged. Our Keir Simmons questioning Putin late tonight. Mr. President, is this what you call democracy? And police capturing a suspected coast-to-coast -coast murderer in a shootout accused of killing a police officer on a highway in New Mexico just days after allegedly murdering an EMT in South Carolina. And parts of Pennsylvania sheltering in place again this morning, one day after a killing spree there left three dead. This carjacking victim speaking out today. I was sitting in my car and someone banged on my window and then he pulled the gun out. And powerful volcanic eruptions in Iceland triggering a state of emergency, stunning images of lava flowing toward towns. And winter is not over yet. The dangerous cold snap about to send temperatures plunging. And on this St. Patrick's Day, the country has gone green. This is NBC Nightly News. Good evening, I'm Gotti Schwartz. Tonight in Moscow, Vladimir Putin is celebrating what appears to be a huge victory. How's this for a landslide? Putin is currently projected to win 88% of the vote, giving him another six years. Now, of course, elections in Russia are not considered free or fair by international overseers, so the outcome was never in doubt. But what was in question, how big would the protest vote be? Across Russia, there were signs of opposition, Molotov cocktails thrown at polling locations, protesters pouring dye in ballot boxes. And there was a call for those opposed to Putin to show up at noon today to vote, and that may have led to long lines like these. In his victory speech tonight, Putin said his win is proof the country is united behind him. Our Keir Simmons is in Moscow and questioned Putin tonight. Election night in Moscow. President Putin celebrating a landslide victory, which was never in doubt. At his campaign headquarters, NBC News, the first international news organization to question him. Journalist Evan Gershkovich spent this election in prison. Boris Nadirshtin, who opposes your war in Ukraine, wasn't allowed to stand against you. And Alexei Navalny died in one of your prisons during your campaign. Mr. President, is this what you call democracy? Ignoring Gershkovich, Putin said Nadezhdin was unpopular and Navalny died. That's life, he said. Putin did say that days before Navalny's death, he agreed to exchange him on condition he never returned. Deceased opposition leader Alexei Navalny, before his death last month, had called for protests at polling stations. These lines of many young people looked like the response among the 75 people detained was a man wearing a Navalny t-shirt. Others threw Molotov cocktails or poured dye into ballot boxes. Navalny's widow, Yulia, joining a protest in Berlin. There could be no any negotiations and nothing with Mr. Putin because he is a killer, he is a gangster. Another opponent, Boris Nadirshtin, who spoke out against the war, wasn't allowed to stand. He voted today with his family, a stark contrast to Putin, who voted alone on a computer Friday. Of course, our election is not very fair, not very free, of course. Sometimes we will have normal, democratic, free and fair election Russian Federation. You believe that one day? Uh, I believe not, of course, on this day. And Kier joins us from Moscow, where that Putin press conference just wrapped up. And, and Kier, Russia says this is the biggest vote for Putin in his 24 years of leading the country? That's right, Guardian. Russian officials also say this is the largest turnout of President Putin's leadership. There will be many around the world who will question that. Alexei Navalny's wife, Yulia, calling on global leaders not to recognize this election. Guardian. Keir Simmons in Moscow, thank you. And back in the U.S., a dramatic early morning pursuit in New Mexico ended a manhunt for a suspect believed to have killed a police officer there and another first responder on the East Coast just days before. Priya Shrether reports on what we're learning about the suspect and his victims. 
A two-day cross-country manhunt has come to an end after a police shootout early this morning. 33-year-old Jeremy Smith was captured after allegedly killing a police officer in New Mexico before he was captured by authorities after being spotted by a gas station clerk. During this time, as they had an eye on Mr. Smith, a foot pursuit ensued. Shots were fired. Some shots strike Smith. Authorities say Officer Justin Hare stopped to help Smith with the flat tire on Friday morning when Smith allegedly shot and killed him. Police say Smith pushed Hare's body into the passenger seat before taking off in his patrol car, which was later found abandoned. The last words Officer Hare uttered on this earth was to offer help to a man who's about to kill him. Police say when Officer Hare first approached Smith, he was driving a car that belonged to 52-year-old Phoenicia Machado 4, a South Carolina paramedic who was reported missing by her family on Thursday. Friday, her body was found, and authorities say Smith is a person of interest in her death. We want to extend our heartfelt condolences to that community for their loss of a fellow first responder. Tonight, tributes from across the country are pouring in for the two victims. Machado 4 is remembered as a loving mother and grandmother and dedicated first responder. And 35-year-old Justin Hare, a devoted father of two girls who had another baby on the way. We'll now be able to spend some time focusing on honoring him in the best way that we can and grieving his loss. So Priya, what are the next steps in these case? So right now, Smith is being treated in a nearby hospital as investigation continues in both South Carolina and New Mexico. Gotti? Priya, thanks so much. And it was another terrifying day in Pennsylvania. Parts of suburban Philadelphia once again forced to shelter in place just 24 hours after a killing spree started there and spread into a neighboring state. George Solis has the latest. This was the scene this morning in Bucks County, Pennsylvania, in a suburb just outside Philadelphia. Right out my back window, there were cops running around with guns. For the second day in a row now, a community was placed in lockdown as authorities responded to the threat of an armed suspect. It's quite scary. According to police, this morning's standoff started when a man allegedly assaulted a woman in this housing development. The suspect eventually surrendering after a two and a half hour standoff. We were able to successfully uh, locate the gentleman and place him in custody without incident and no injuries to police. The dramatic scene, less than 24 hours after the harrowing scenes in neighboring Falls Township, Bucks County. I don't know if I've actually processed it, you know what I mean? Authorities arresting and charging 26-year-old Andre Gordon, who they say murdered three of his family members before crossing state lines into Trenton, New Jersey, where police say he had taken hostages inside a home. These dramatic images of SWAT officers pulling people from a roof the suspect somehow breaking through the police line, but later surrendered less than a mile from the home. Well, it's apparent that he left before the police arrived. Tonight, court documents obtained by NBC News revealing authorities say Gordon used a so-called ghost gun to commit the murders and carjack two individuals. Police say one of those victims was Sonia Hansen. And then he pulled the gun out, and my grandson seen the gun. He's only nine years old. He jumped out the car and ran. Gordon now faces multiple charges related to the murders, carjackings, and possession of weapons, according to authorities. I'm back now with George in Levittown, Pennsylvania, at the home where one of the murders took place. George, do we know if the suspect will be charged in Pennsylvania? Yeah, Gotti, and first we should know that some people have been stopping by the home here today, none saying a word, and you'll notice that there may be some plywood here on the front door, possibly connected to that force entry noted by authorities. As far as extradition, authorities tell me he expected, Andre Gordon expected to be extradited back here to Pennsylvania in the coming days. Gotti? George Lees, thank you. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is blasting recent comments by Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer. And Schumer, the highest ranking Jewish elected official in the U.S., said Netanyahu and his cabinet are a barrier to long term peace in the region. Today, Netanyahu firing back. I think what he said is totally inappropriate. Uh, it's inappropriate for uh, uh, to go to a sister democracy and try to replace the elected leadership there. And the comments come as Israel faces growing backlash over its invasion of Gaza. And to the 2024 election now, with both President Biden and former President Trump locking up their nominations, there's a new block of voters who could decide the election. They're being called the double haters because they don't like either candidate. So how will they vote come November? Shaquille Brewster talked to some of them in the swing state of Wisconsin. Excuse me there. 
How are you? I'm from NBC News. Can I ask you a quick question? First thing that comes to mind. Oh, boy. What do you think when you see these two options? Not great. In Battleground, Wisconsin, the choice these swing voters face in November is one they prefer not to make. Are you excited about this? these being your options? <laughs> Quite honestly, no. I can't say that I'm happy about either option. What's the word that you think when you see these two candidates running for president? Oh, hell no. They're the so-called double haters. Why is it them two again? It happened four years ago. And they could decide the election by holding their nose and voting for one of the major party candidates, choosing not to vote at all, or... I'd like to have more choices. Well, funny you say that, because asking you shall receive. Well, look at that. Does it change at all if I do that? and give you a third option. Depending on who that is. Coca-Cola or Pepsi. Maybe we do need a third option. Support for third party candidates is one of the biggest wild cards this election. In a February poll, 21% of voters backed third party candidates with independent Robert F. Kennedy grabbing 15%. <laughs> For context, in 1992, Ross Perot snagged 19% of the vote in what's considered one of the more successful third-party bids. And the options may grow. The group No Labels is vowing to field a unity ticket, pairing a Democrat with a Republican. If somebody steps up to the plate other than these two, I would consider it. But the challenges are massive. Getting on the ballot in all 50 states, fundraising, and navigating hot button issues like abortion. But perhaps the biggest hurdle. If the third party option makes it easier for Trump to win, would you even consider it? Oh, no. Absolutely not. No. I believe it would be disruptive. Perot was blamed for taking votes away from George H.W. Bush and giving the presidency to Bill Clinton just as Ralph Nader is still attacked for shifting liberal votes away from Al Gore in 2000. Just doesn't get any closer than this. But for many of these double haters, they want to have the choice to vote with their heart. Could you see yourself voting for a third party in this election? Absolutely, I could. Shaquille Brewster, NBC News, Wauwatosa, Wisconsin. And spring is just a few days away, but this winter weather is not behind us yet. Look at this. 21 million people across parts of the South are under alert from now through Tuesday, looking at temperatures in the 20s and 30s. It'll be ice cold as far south as Montgomery, Alabama. And clear skies this weekend for a lot of the nation's biggest St. Patrick's Day celebrations. No one throws a party like they do in Boston. Here's their St. Patty's Day parade today. Always a big turnout since it's got one of the largest Irish populations in the country. And in New York, an estimated 2 million people lined up along Fifth Avenue to watch bagpipers, floats, and more on Saturday. Meanwhile, they were seeing green for the 69th year for the dying of the Chicago River. And still ahead tonight, the massive new volcanic eruption rocking Iceland. And we are back with some astonishing new images out of Iceland following another powerful volcanic eruption there. The massive lava flow snaking its way towards one town and forcing the evacuation of the world-famous Blue Lagoon. Josh Letterman has the latest. Tonight, a blazing wall of lava is spreading across southern Iceland. A volcano spewing bright orange smoke, seen here in stunning photos from a Coast Guard helicopter, for the fourth time in as many months. This time threatening Iceland's most famous tourist attraction, the Blue Lagoon Hot Spring, where bathers had just minutes to flee. We're evacuating. Oh, look at that. Wow. American Melissa Izer's vacation with her husband interrupted mid-meal. As the waitress is bringing my wine, heard the, the sound go off, and that's when my husband and I looked at each other, and they said, okay, evacuation in route. Local media say hundreds in a town near the Blue Lagoon have now fled to safety. Everybody was steady and prepared. Meteorological authorities say the volcano erupted with little notice, just about 40 minutes and carved a fissure into the earth nearly two miles long, triggering a state of emergency, an orange glow visible from more than 20 miles away in Reykjavik, the capital. Volcanoes are common in Iceland, which sits atop a geological hotspot. This volcano has been erupting roughly once a month since December, but this eruption appears to be the biggest yet. 
No deaths have been reported. And tonight, defensive barriers built to contain the lava are holding so far. But scientists say it may only be the beginning. We might have eruptions on the peninsula for the uh, on and off for the next few hundred years. A fiery future for an island where volcanoes are a fact of life. Josh Letterman, NBC News. We are back now in a moment with a closer look at the parachute technology that's just helped a California family survive a plane crash. Plus, a major retailer is making some big changes to those self-checkout lanes. We're going to tell you about that coming up. And Target stores are making a big change starting today. You know those self-checkout lanes? Well, Target is now limiting the number of items you can buy there to just 10. The retail giant says it's working to make checkout lanes move faster and is even experimenting with adding back more staffed checkout lanes to handle shoppers with more merchandise. And the California family is alive tonight after a plane crash that could have been so much worse if not for the parachute technology that brought the entire plane down safely. Stephen Romo has more. We're getting reports of a plane crash at 76250 East Fall Road. This is what first responders saw when they arrived at the scene of a small plane crash in Northern California last week. A single engine at Cirrus SR-22 aircraft split in two and partially upside down. And the three occupants are currently code four on the ground. On board, pilot Artem Kononuk, his partner, and their two-year-old daughter, who suffered only minor cuts and scratches, according to the Mendocino County Sheriff's Office. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, whoa. And in Washington state. Is anybody else seeing this? Holy sh this SR-22 crashing in a busy Bellevue neighborhood. We heard like a loud bang, so we thought it was like gunshots or something, so we got scared. Like Neighbors saw two men climb out with no apparent injuries. I'm not surprised at all to see these stories. Uh, Former NTSB investigator Jeff Gazzetti points to the type of aircraft's built-in Cirrus airframe parachute system, or CAPS for short. And rather than just having the airplane crash, they reach up, they pull a T-handle, it activates a solid rocket booster, which pulls a parachute out, and in eight seconds, you're safely swinging underneath the parachute. It's really quite revolutionary. And it sounds like once they're used, is this a survival rate for a, a crash involving one of these parachutes? Is it pretty high? It's very high. There's just been a handful of uh, fatalities or injuries that occurred even after deploying the parachute According to the Cirrus Owners and Pilots Association, there have been 128 saves and 263 survivors with this CAP system. But Gazzetti warns a parachute is no replacement for good pilot training. You know, you still need piloting skills to make emergency landings. Uh, there's so many other aspects. But on those few select accidents in which a parachute comes in handy, this particular airplane has a very good success story. And when we come back, there is good news tonight. The surprise of a lifetime for a beloved college security guard. How the students made it all happen. And there is good news tonight about finding family far from home and the college students coming together to show their dorm security guard just how much he means to them. For the students from Raymond Hall Dorm at Rhode Island's Providence College, beloved security guard James Mugaji is more than just a friend. To guys like freshman Brandon Reichert, he's family. What is it about him that, that draws people in? He's a beacon of light in our community. He's always smiling. He's always willing to, to help people. So they celebrated James on his birthday because his own family lives across the globe in Nigeria. I'm blessed because this is the first time someone is going to celebrate my birthday for me since I've been in this country. Thank you. That emotional moment setting the stage for another surprise. So it's almost like you give him the birthday cake. Happy and then you think, hey, wait, what if he could celebrate with his family? Yeah, absolutely. Turns out James hadn't been back in Nigeria for more than a decade. 
So they started an online fundraiser to buy him a ticket home, hoping to raise three grand by the end of the semester. But they hit that goal in just hours. I love whiskey. Our gift to you is a trip to Nigeria, so. <laughs> Dormare Daniel Singh giving James the good news. I don't know how much I can thank you. Uh, I pray from the bottom of my heart that uh, God will continue to protect you guys, to make sure that you achieve your goals. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you guys. We wanted to talk to James, but understandably, he is totally overwhelmed. What did he say after you presented him with that check? He woke his family up and told them. I said, James, who's that on the phone? He said, oh, it's my son. His little son said, thank you and God bless. That little boy said thank you for allowing his dad to come home. Yeah, absolutely. Just thank you and God bless you. Blessings for the man who's gone above and beyond to be there for them. How about that? James is hoping to make the trip home to Nigeria in June. Oh, and by the way, it gets even better. That online fundraiser the students started is now almost $30,000. That's NBC Nightly News for this Sunday. Lester Holt will be in tomorrow. I'm Gotti Schwartz. Thanks so much for watching. And have a great night. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.